Okay, welcome to the Believer School of Ministry, and uh, glad you're here. Today's lesson is called Sharing Your Faith as a Lifestyle. We're all called to share our faith, and we should do it as a lifestyle. It's not something that we do on just on Saturdays, go out door to door, passing out tracks or whatever. It's something we can do every day of our lives. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you can go on our website at tomshanklin.org and you will find uh, the teaching notes for this because you're going to get a lot more out of this if you have the teaching notes because we're going to kind of go through this quickly. There's a lot of scripture reference and the idea is uh, listen to the teaching but then go back and study the scriptures. Uh, we're not trying to uh, uh, propagandize you. We're trying to impart Bible knowledge to you and the best way you can get it really in your heart is to study the Bible on your own. So get the teaching notes, get in the Word, let God embed this into your heart and you'll find your life will be changed and you'll be able to share Christ uh, more effectively. <laughs> Praise God. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for each one that's here and, and uh, those that may be watching by uh, video or listening by audio. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, I have so enjoyed sharing your gospel all around the world. And, and it's such a privilege to share to crowds, but Lord, also just to one person on an airplane or in a mall or somewhere else, just telling people what Jesus has done in our lives and, and letting them know that they can have Jesus in their lives too. They can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So I ask your blessing today upon, the, uh, upon this teaching. And Lord, last night we asked that you would ignite a fire. Yes, Lord. Today we pray that you would pour fuel on the fire. And it would be a sustaining fuel, not just uh, lighter fluid, but Lord, something that would continue to burn for many, many years to come, Lord, as long as we're here, that we would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, it's interesting, you think about the things that we do as Christians, you know, we worship, that's really neat. We share with one another, fellowship, we get in the Word, you know, we fellowship with Jesus, we, all these things that we do, but there's only one thing that we won't be able to do when, once we get into eternity with the Lord. We won't be able to share with a lost person. We'll be able to fellowship with one another, we'll be able to worship, We'll be able to get in the Word. We'll be able to work for God in some ways. I don't know exactly what all that's going to entail, but at that point in time, you know, all the witnessing is done. So we've got to get that done while we're here. Amen. Amen. So let's open our Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark 16, 15. And you know, last night we shared about how Jesus, I'm going to take this sweater off to begin with. It's going to preach hard. Yeah. Uh, last night we talked about how Jesus went by the, the shore and saw these fishermen and said, come after me, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And um, of those men that he called, the one that we think of most is, which one? Peter. Peter, Peter is really a predominant figure in the Bible, amen? He, he's someone that we, we see in action. I mean, he, he's the one that Jesus said, you know, upon this rock I'll build my church. The, he ha he's the one that had the revelation of Jesus as Savior, and, and he said, you're blessed, Simon Barjona, you know, but he was willing to leave his nets and go after Jesus and follow him. And you see just a, a willingness in Peter to step out, amen? You know, uh, one time Jesus said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a, for a draw to fishes. And uh, Peter said, well, I fished all night. We fished all night, we haven't caught a thing. But at your word, will let down the net. See, he was willing to launch out in the deep and do something that wasn't, maybe uh, the natural man wouldn't be inclined to. He had this willingness to step out, you know. And we see that he also uh, 
walked on the water. He got out of the boat. <laughs> you know? And this is really what God, I believe, wants to do. He wants to get us out of our boat. Amen? He wants us to step out somewhere beyond our comfort zone. Amen? And, and sharing your faith is like that, isn't it? Because it's more comfortable just to be quiet. <laughs> Except when the Spirit of God starts working in your heart, then you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta share, you know. But Peter had that willingness, and he, he got out of the boat, and he walked on the water, amen? And the only way that God's gonna really meet us miraculously is if we get out of the boat, and we step out, and we do something that we can't do in our natural self, amen? We have to learn to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And witnessing is like that. We have to trust in the Lord and let Him work through us. Amen. Get out beyond our comfort zone. Step out. Just press through that fear. Amen. Because we all have that intimidation of sharing. You know, what are they going to say? What's going to happen? But, you know, God has a way. That's one thing I've found. If you ever come up against a brick wall, the Lord knows how to deal with that. Amen. So look to the Lord draw on the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit and he'll take you through that wall. Amen? He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. And so uh, when you get up in the morning say, Lord, here I am. I'm open for business. I'm ready to be used by you. And get that mindset going, you know, because we miss a lot of opportunities to share Jesus Christ. And I think I, I can say that for all of us. I know it's true for me. Because we're busy, we've got our mindset on these things that we have to do, we've got our plan, we've got our strategy, and we kind of got our head down, and we're going for those things that we need to do. We need to get our head up and look for those opportunities. We need to see, oh, where's that person that God is bringing me into contact today that needs a word from the Lord, amen? That needs to hear some good news today. Where are they, you know? And God will open our eyes. You know, we'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He'll know, you know, He'll show us who's ready and who, who wants something that we have. All right. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. Could somebody read that for us? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Hallelujah. Amen. Signs follow believers. Signs follow us when we preach the gospel. Amen? Amen? Some Christians are busy following signs, but God's plan is that signs would follow us. Can I have an amen? amen. And he said to go into all the world. And we've always has to have this concept of some tribe over in Africa that that's all the world. But all the world is all around us. Amen? There's a mission field right here. And I tell you, America needs Jesus desperately. Amen? And I know we have probably people watching from other countries too. Your country needs Jesus too. But right now, pray for America because, boy, I tell you, this, the, the signs aren't good. The things that we see. But the, <clears throat> the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is people's hearts being changed from the Lord. For the Lord. And you know, Sometimes we've got the idea we've got to fight a political battle and you know, I think we should be involved in politics and we should vote and, and so on. Or we should fight a culture war against this problem, this problem, this sin and so on. But what we most need to do is we need to evangelize our nation. That's right. Because when people's hearts change, they'll want to do what's right. The Bible said that when Jesus comes into your life, he writes his laws in your hearts. And we began to want to do what's right. So instead of abortion, people want to live a holy life and do right. And they want to have marriages that succeed. And they want to do things according to the word of God. Amen. So go into all the world. Go into your world. Praise God. We've got to go into the world, the place that we, where we live. And he said, signs will follow us. What signs? Casting out 
devils, evil spirits. We have authority over evil spirits. Uh, signs will follow us. We will speak in unknown languages. That's biblical to speak in unknown languages. And, and uh, in the, in the uh, lesson on the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be talking about that. He said he'll give us divine protection where we go. I had a man prophesy over me the other day and say that God was setting, stationing angels around me. So if I went into dangerous places, they were going to take care of me. I thought that's pretty good. I like that. And so, uh, and then finally, lay hands on the sick and they, what? Recover. They will recover. Amen. And so they went everywhere and the Lord worked with them. And, he, and, you know, we need to have that confidence that wherever we go, the Lord is with us. When we're sharing with one person, you know, in, in the Cenex store or the crowds in India. Either way, the Lord is with us. Amen. He's into this thing. This is his thing. Amen. This is his business. Amen. And so he will get involved and he will work with us. Amen. And a lot of times, you know, yeah, we need to have the understanding of the gospel and we need to be able to share the gospel message. But sometimes the thing that opens a per person's heart most is the love. The love of God. And the Bible said the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart. Just show somebody love. You know, when you pray for somebody for a need in their life, that's showing the love of God. I don't know how many people have just been touched if I just said, well, can I pray for you? And just, just quietly, just put my hand on their shoulder if it's appropriate, you know, and just pray in the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you, the power of God is there, you know. And people say, hey, whoo. I felt something there. And they go, yeah, that's Jesus. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus Christ has given to us. And he'll give it to you too. So that many times that'll open the door. Amen. We need to, you know, we need to relax and get in the flow of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I believe we need to have a structure in our mind about how to share the gospel. We need to be ready to give an answer of the reason that the hope is in us. And at the same time, we need to be led by the Spirit in that particular situation. Because you might try to talk to somebody about getting to heaven and they might ha not have the least bit of care about getting to heaven. Because they're concerned about paying their mortgage next month. But you can pray for them about the need that they feel in their life. You know, I'll tell you what, getting to heaven is a lot more important than that mortgage. But they don't know that. you got to meet them where they're at. You know, you see Jesus. That's what he did. He met people where they're at. You know, he gave them uh, big meals. Praise God. <laughs> he must have had quite a MasterCard, you know. <laughs> Uh, he healed the sick and made the lame to walk and opened the blind eyes. You know, he met people where they were at and they were drawn to the Lord. I know in my own life, that's how I was drawn to the Lord. I saw his power in action. It got me, uh, my attention, you know. Uh, that's really what I was looking, at, looking for. I was looking for a reality. I was looking for a spiritual reality. I wasn't thinking that much about heaven. But I had a desire, a hunger within me. A yearning. It was a yearning for God. You know, a seed had been planted in me when I was a child, but I wasn't living for God. But when I saw the power of God, you know, that's when I started to pursue the Lord. And there was other factors that entered into that too, you know. As I shared last night, that when I began to learn about the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus and saw how real and true it is, you know, it began to break down those walls of... Uh, uh, pseudo-intellectualism that I had gotten when I was in college where professors said, you know, there is no God and things like that. And I began to say, hey, wait a minute now, there's no God? But here it says that Jesus hung on the cross. Here Jesus, God uh, prophesied this hundreds of years before it ever happened. And I began to get my eyes open, you know. And then different things happened in my life. But everybody's on a journey. You know, lifestyle evangelism is being intersecting with people on their journey. Uh, I mean, I remember another, I'm not following my notes very well here, but it's just coming. But, you know, uh, I remember when we were vagabond hippies, my wife and I, and we, at times we would go to orchards and pick fruit in order to, to make money. And we worked in an apple orchard in Illinois. And at this orchard there was a, a man, his name was Marvin. And uh, he, actually he worked a full-time job, but on his vacation he would come out and pick apples. And this guy, was, this guy was one of the best apple pickers I ever saw. He would pick 160 bushels a day, which is a lot. You know. He could crank it out, you know. And he was a worker, man. 
he he would he would do things on that ladder that I <laughs> I don't understand how he would do those things. And he would work, work, work. But every time I'd come by, he'd stop. And he'd look down at me from that ladder and he'd say, Hello, Brother Tom. <laughs> he'd talk to me like I was saved, you know, and he he'd say, You know, Jesus said, and he'd give me a scripture. He'd give me he just plant a little seed, you know, and so my wife and I called him Angel. And he really he really did have an impact on our life. Now we weren't saved under his ministry. He never was able to pray the sinner's prayer with me, but you know, he was a seed planner in our lives. And then later when I received the Lord, uh, I called his house and got to talk to his wife and said, be sure to tell Marvin that uh, I got born again. Praise, Praise God. Lord. And uh, It's like talking life into people, isn't it? Yeah. You talk life into them. Even though they're not saved, you see and you talk to them as if they were. Yeah, that's kind of what he did. Yeah. And he, he called himself a Lutheran, a Luther Costal. <laughs> he was... He was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but he was, he was a Lutheran. Praise God, precious man. The most effective form of evangelism is what you do every day, where you live, where you work, where you play. It's just being an influence, a help, a blessing to people, and bringing the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ to them right where they live. It's being good to people and letting them know why. I'll share another testimony with you. I, just, I heard this recently from... Uh, a man that uh, uh, actually he's a pastor a Korean American pastor and uh, he was sharing the story about uh, uh, and he lives in a I think a city in California I don't remember which city but anyway it doesn't really matter but one day he saw the garbage truck coming by and God just dropped in his heart get some juice for the garbage guys and get, just give them a drink of, of juice and so he called his wife and said, hey, get some juice, you know, and she rounded up what they had and they got a pitcher and he went out and he got them and said, hey, you know, just take a little break. It's a really, really hot day. Have, have some juice. So they come and they sit down at the little patio table and, and uh, they give them all a glass of juice. And he just said, you know, I just wanted to give you guys a drink of juice. You know, he said, a few years ago, I never would have done anything like this, but Jesus Christ came into my life and he gave me a love for people and I just felt that love for you today and I just wanted you to have a drink of juice. And so they left and they went and they did their garbage thing. And uh, a couple years later, him and his wife moved to another part of the city. And of course, when you move, you have all this garbage, right? So uh, at the end of the uh, driveway, they <laughs> put all this garbage out and they thought, oh man, we're giving them a load. We better just, we better do something nice for the garbage guys just to show them that we appreciate everything they're doing and, and so on. So they made them breakfast, got all prepared. Garbage guys come by and say, hey, you know, we see, you know, you see, we've got an awful lot of garbage out of here. We just wanted to bless you guys and give you some breakfast. Can you come on in and just have a little breakfast? So they come in, they, they eat the breakfast. And so he gets ready to give his little speech again, you know. Well, you know, uh, Jesus came into my life and that's why I have love for people and that's why, you know, and right in the middle of his speech, this one guy per perks up and says, yeah, I know what you're going to say. I was on the garbage detail over in the other part of the city when you gave us the juice. And he said, you know what? That so impacted my life that I began to seek the Lord. I began to go to church and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> so Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. So the good things that we do for people, they're opportunities. They open the door. Amen. But we also need to let them know why, you know, and let them, let them know that we're believers in Jesus Christ and that he's put that love in our hearts and however God leads you to share that. But, you know, mix your witness with some good works and loving people and you'll see fruit from that. Amen. Because people, there's so many people that desperately need love. You know, I mean, they just need some, somebody to show them a little attention and friendship. Praise the Lord. All right, statistics prove over and over again uh, as surveys are taken, 80 to 90% of the people that come to Christ come as a result of a witness or invitation from a friend or relative. So there's proclamation evangelism, which I do, I love to do. And I thank God for the results we see from that. And then there's media evangelism, there's advertising. A friend of mine is going to be putting up a billboard in his town and I'm helping him to work on that. 
uh, about about the cross and about God. But by far the most effective evangelism is you reaching out in a personal level to those around you. When I was as I mentioned, a vagabond hippie at times. Then we finally settled in southern Minnesota and we built a house for $500 and then went broke and had to get a job real quick. I got a job in a sawmill and there was a Christian there. Thank God there was a Christian Amen. in the place I worked. Amen. Some people say, oh, I wish I'd get out of this dead-end job and become a preacher, you know? Maybe you're supposed to be in that job, so-called dead-end. It's not dead-end. Amen? <laughs> There's people there that you can give life to. And God will bless you. Amen? And he'll use you there. Well, anyway, I'm preaching again. But there was a man there. His name's Chuck. And Chuck had a real similar background to mine. He was in drugs and the hippie lifestyle, him and his wife. But they had found Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so he would invite me to come to their church and tell me about, a little bit about what Jesus had done in their lives. And I would make fun of him, you know. And he would say, oh, they're spirit-filled. And I say, you know, I, what, how do you know they're spirit-filled? And, you know, it was just, he wasn't really making a lot of headway. But anyway, one day he invited us over for dinner with him and his wife. And so we went over to their house and they made us a nice meal and, and uh, just kind of loved us, you know, and, and shared their testimony, what God had done in their life. And then at the end of the meal, as we were getting ready to leave, they said, well, you should come over to our church. We have this evangelist coming. And so we almost felt obligated. We said, well, they've been so nice to us. I guess we should, I guess we should go once. And uh, July 4th, 1977, we went. An evangelist was there preaching the gospel. And God really touched our lives. And we didn't surrender our lives until you know, two or three months later. Susan before I did and then we, we really our lives were really changed by Jesus Christ but you know I think about back on that and I think you know what a ministry that couple had to invite us I, you know that was um, that was such a strategic plan of God you know God used them as much as any preacher or minister so called in our lives they were ministering to us and at that time he wasn't preacher eventually he became a pastor but you know, God uses ordinary people. Amen? Amen? And wherever you're at, I mean, God's got a strategic plan for you. <clears throat> All right? Uh, work with your Bible-believing church. You know, thank God for the local church. That, that's in my heart, and I think always will be, God loves the local church. Find a good local church you can be part of that where the gospel is preached and where the word is taught and where people can become disciples and work with that church, you know, and, and invite people to come. And, you know, it's not all about just one particular local church. We're building the kingdom of God. But the local church is a strategic place for God's ministry to take place. And so God wants us to be part of a local church and, you know, strategically align ourselves with the church so that we can witness to people, share with them, and invite them to come to our church. Not that we're pressuring them, they got to be part of our church. They might go somewhere else and that's just fine. But work with your local church because that's a, God's plan is for the local church to be a, you know, sometimes I think of a combine, you know, it's like it's got all these different parts, you know, to kind of process the the white fields, you know, and bring them in and process them and so on. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a team effort. Be a team player. Uh, be, be a witness through a holy lifestyle. People are looking at what you do more than what you say. Ask God to give you grace to walk in holiness, to love people, to uh, not allow bitterness in your life, not allow sinfulness in your life, and, and to just be an example. All right, part number one. <clears throat> we are all called to minister. Somebody read Ephesians 4. Uh, 11 and 12 for us. All right. Yeah, read 11 and 12. We, I have through 16 there in your personal study. You can go through the 16. Some apostles, but. some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right. And the Amplified Version, 
talks about that, uh, anybody have an amplified version? I wish I had the whole, could read the whole thing. But the idea is that he's called these five ministry gifts for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry so that they might do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body of the church. This is a mentality that we, we need to have. You know, I believe probably most of you here, you already have that mentality. But that's very, very important because the church has missed that. They've got their eyes on the preachers. Thank God for the preachers. But the preacher's job is to equip God's people so that they can do the work of ministering towards building up Christ's body, the church. We're to build one another up. We're to bring people in. We're all involved in the ministry of reconciliation. It's a team effort. 99% of all Christians are not vocational ministers, but yet God has a call for each one of us. God's called us to the ministry of reconciliation. If every Christian would lead one person to Christ each year, the church would double every year. Just lead one person to Christ and help them become a disciple. The church doubles. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes we think, oh, that's too small of a thing to do. No. <laughs> it's the power of multiplication. It's multi-level marketing, <laughs> as we say today. You know. All right. There's a man named Tommy Hicks who was uh, a minister back in, I believe, the 50s. And he had a tremendous vision, or night, night vision or dream. And it was repeated several times. It was a supernatural impartation of truth from God. And in his vision, he saw a great giant shaking himself from debris and junk. He was just all this junk. It was kind of the Gulliver's travel thing. And he was just under all this weight of stuff. And he saw the giant begin to pull the stuff off himself and begin to shake himself free and began to stand up uh, on the earth. A great giant. And then the giant began to melt into the earth and he saw like uh, rivers or rivulets of gold and silver and things flowing all over the earth. Then he had a vision of ordinary believers all around the world in huts and on the streets and cities and just out in the workplace and all over the world just touching people, doing miracles, doing the supernatural and God moving so mightily by his spirit. And the picture is the body of Christ that God wants to shake, us, shake ourselves loose from the debris of this world and the sinfulness and come into that walk of holiness with him, live with him and let him work through us and he's going to do great and mighty things. And by the way, if you're not perfect, join the crowd. Amen? You know, when we talk about holiness, sometimes we get under it. We say, well, I guess that leaves me out. No, God just wants you pressing forward. Amen? He knows where you're at. We talked about Peter and you know how he had that willingness to hop out there and do something for the Lord. Thank God for that. But you know, at the end there, when Jesus was crucified, he denied the Lord three times. And Peter failed. He did some crazy stuff, you know. But the Lord restored him, forgave him. Tell you what, God uses ordinary people and God uses imperfect people. Amen. Be sincere, be real. Amen. If you miss it, admit it. Amen. And get on with God and receive the power of the blood of Jesus. And just be a real person and people will see that. Amen. And you see how God used Peter, you know, in the, his first sermon after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people came to the Lord. Uh, he, the, the lame man at the gate, beautiful, got up and walked. Praise God, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Give I thee in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God, and another 5,000 got saved. Amen. And God can use you like that. Amen? And uh, his shadow, he walked down the street and his shadow healed the sick and they got up off of, um, you know, off their stretchers and began to walk and were healed. Praise God. He raised the dead. Hallelujah. And that is our destiny. You know, we can do the works of Jesus. Praise God. And God wants us to, to rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit in this day, of our, day and hour. Amen. Evangelism flows out of our own personal relationship with the Lord. Spending time with the Lord is not wasted time. Amen. Worshiping, communing with Him, brings you into touch with Him and His heart. Amen. And His love and His wisdom. 
and his boldness. We talk about, uh, in the last lesson, we're going to talk about the boldness that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. As I said, Peter denied Christ three times, but after he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he stood up boldly and preached the Word of God. And then they were persecuted, so they had a prayer meeting. They got the whole church together. And they said, Grant unto your servants boldness that they may speak your word, stretching forth your hand to heal in the name of your holy child Jesus. And then it said, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I thought they had already been filled. Yeah, they were already filled, but they got filled some more. Amen. Amen. And that's what we need to We need to be continually filled with the Spirit. Amen. It's not just a one-time thing. You know, oh, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit back in 1940. <laughs> Praise God, it was a wonderful experience. That's great, but what about today, amen? We can enjoy God's Spirit today, amen? And He's got an ongoing plan for us. All right, number two, lifestyle evangelism is about loving people. Loving people. Some people's religion makes them mean. I trust that's not, <laughs> not uh, your testimony. <laughs> but we don't see that in the ministry of Jesus. He, he reached out to sinners. You know, he was condemned by the Pharisees because he ate with sinners. Uh, he forgave people and then challenged them to go and sin no more. Did you see how many times Jesus would just heal someone? He didn't say, repent first and then I'll heal you. He healed them. And then he said, now go and sin no more. Amen. And that touch of God, I believe, that caused many people to be converted. But see, we have to love people where they're at. It doesn't mean we soft sell sin. We don't talk about sin. But it's that compassion, that love of Jesus, that acceptance. You know, the scripture said in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, uh, 17, or 19, I think it is, that uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins unto them. And you see, judgmentalism will hinder us in witnessing to people. Because we, we in our religiosity, will look at someone that has some kind of sin, whether it be homosexuality or, or uh, drug addiction, or you know they're in a jail because of some crime, and we say, well, God can't help them. You know, and we've got this standoffish attitude. But God in his mercy reaches out to all those people. Amen? Amen. He's not willing that any should perish, That's right. but that all should come to repentance. So we need to be like Jesus and show mercy. Amen? Uh, we need to tell them the truth, but not beat them over the head with it. Tell, speak the truth in love. Amen? Amen. And that will open the door to share Jesus. Scripture said in Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. You see that in the ministry of Jesus when uh, he was talking to Zacchaeus. He saw Zacchaeus up in the tree. Zacchaeus obviously had a hunger. He was up in the tree, wanted to see Jesus, who he was. So there was, <clears throat> you know, we talked earlier about uh, being open for business. Well, Jesus was open for business. When he saw that guy up in the tree, he says, oh, that's a sign. <laughs> He's hungry for Jesus, right? Okay. There's signs in front of our eyes of people that are ready to hear about Jesus. Amen. They may not be up in a tree, but there's a sign. Just keep your eyes open. Amen. There's people that are ready. There's people that are ready even in Norman County. And Manoman County. Amen. There's people that are ready up here. Oh, you know, we might think, well, this is a tough area, but it's not too, too tough of a nut for, for Jesus to crack. Amen. Amen. God's got a plan for these people. He loves these people, and he wants to love them through you. Anyway, I got off on the sidetrack there about Zacchaeus. <laughs> but Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And there he was in that tree, and Jesus said, let's do lunch, Zacchaeus. I'm, I need to have lunch at your house. So Zacchaeus came down, made him a great lunch, and there's Jesus sitting next to Zacchaeus, and they're having lunch. And we don't know what Jesus said. We don't know if he preached a sermon there. Or, I, I assume that Jesus was just being Jesus. He was just loving Zacchaeus and those that were there. Amen. The love of God 
that was in him was flowing out to them. All of a sudden, Zacchaeus stands up and says, hey, if I've wronged anybody, I'm going to give it back to fourfold. And I'm going to give away half of my goods to the poor. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, whoa, I see another sign. <laughs> a conversion has taken place. He said, this day is salvation come to this house, for he is the son of Abraham too. Amen? God has a plan for this man too. Yeah, he was a tax collector. They were notorious scoundrels. He, you know, he no doubt had ripped a lot of people off. And some people would have shunned him and said, you know, you're just like a dog. Jesus accepted him and loved him. And his heart was changed, praise God. A miracle took place in his life. To me, that's lifestyle evangelism. Amen? Being open for business and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. One time I was on an airplane uh, going to India and there was a, a woman next to me and uh, she was a, a Hindu woman and she had lived in India I think probably the first like 20 some years of her life and then her and her husband had moved to America and he I believe was a university teacher professor or something and anyway uh, We were talking a little bit, and she asked me what I did. I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel. And she went, oh. <laughs> and it was like you could just feel this wall go up. So I just sat there. I didn't say anything. You know, I'm just kind of fellowshipping with the Lord. And I don't know what else, reading, reading my Bible or whatever. But a little later, you know, I just looked at her and said, uh, so... Actually, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I think I asked her something about her family. And she started talking about her husband and her children, and then I started telling her about my family, and, and we're just kind of chatting, you know, and all of a sudden I noticed the wall was down. And then at that point I just said, has any, anyone ever told you about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and what that really means? She said, no, nobody ever has. Okay, so here she lived, she's about 40, she lived most of her life, about half her life, or a little more in India, and then she came to America, she had been there, you know, 15, 20 years, 15 years, I suppose, something like that. No one had ever told her about Jesus Christ. She had never heard the gospel message. I said, would you mind if I just shared with you what Jesus did for us on the cross and what it means? She says, no, that'd be fine. So I just explained to her the gospel. And then when I was done, I explained to her how a person receives Jesus into their life, you know. And that he would come into her life and he would change her, her heart, you know. And she thanked me, you know, and she wasn't, she wasn't ready to receive the Lord, but she heard the gospel message, amen. And she, I gave her an explanation what she needed to do. So in the quietness of her heart, when the Holy Spirit would come and work, she would know how to be saved and have eternal life. You know. But you see, that wall will prevent many times the interaction that needs to take place. So talking to people, you guys are good. You know, you guys are good at talking to people. You folks up here in northwestern Minnesota, you, you have skills in that, you know. And so God wants you just to have a little, just to add to that a little sensitivity about when to weave in the gospel message and what to share and how much to share and, and how to you know plant those seeds in people's hearts that are going to grow and bring forth a great harvest because you're his witnesses up here praise God okay I feel like I'm getting off on a lot of tangents and <laughs> taking a lot of time here <laughs> praise the Lord Praise God. Could someone read John uh, 20, 21 through 23? John 20, verses 21 through 23. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Now, some people have made a 
doctrine out of that that you have to go to this certain special person and confess your sins to them and then they'll say, you know, your sins are forgiven, wave their hand or whatever they do and you're, you're forgiven. But this really to me is speaking about our witness. If we are going with the attitude of, you know, judgment for a person's sins, then that wall is going to be there. They're not going to be able to receive forgiveness. But if you go with an attitude of forgiveness, you're literally bringing the forgiveness of the Lord to them. Now, they have to make the choice to accept that forgiveness. We don't ignore the rest of the Bible because of this one verse. Okay, We have to see how does it fit in you know, to the plan. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Everyone's called to do that. But if we go with the attitude, you know, you're judged to hell and there's no hope for you, that's not going to help them. We have to go with love. Amen? And notice also that Jesus said, peace be unto you. He gives us his peace, and we carry that peace. You know, one thing in my, in my journey, this is another little part of my journey. This is actually the day that, that I decided to follow Jesus. I was going through a tremendous frustration. I had been going to this church I mentioned uh, for about three months, and God was working on my heart. I was reading the Bible. And I was being drawn by the Lord, you know, tremendously. But at the same time, I still had my habits, and I felt like I was being pulled apart. And I remember one day I went to work on a Monday morning, and you know how Monday mornings can be sometimes. And Monday was a, it was just a bad day. I just hated being there. And I was just so frustrated. I was just willing to just pull my hair out, sort of. And I remember thinking, well, first thing I'm going to do, man, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to the bar, get me some beer, you know. But somehow I got off work and I bypassed that bar. And I went home. And right away my wife and I got in a big fight. And I said, well, let's go for a ride. And I thought, well, I'm going to the, <laughs> go for a ride and I'm going to, going to the bar, you know. Then go to the bar again. Bypassed the liquor store, went on into town, ended up at the preacher's house. Danny Bohan. And he was someone that had a great influence on my life. And I went and I just talked to him about the frustration and how I felt and how I was so tormented, you know. And he talked to me and he said, you know, you need to surrender the Lord and you need to be baptized. And I just listened and, he, and I just told him how fl flustered I was and he just prayed for me. He just put his hand on me and prayed. And you know, when he prayed for me in my unsaved, unregenerate state, a peace came all over me. Supernatural peace came all over me. And you know, that's what we have. We have something to impart to people. We have a peace that we can, we can give. You know, sometimes we, we limit God to working only among believers. He loves unbelievers. He'll minister, he'll heal them. You know, he'll do miracles. He'll show himself strong, amen. And when he prayed for me, that peace came all over me. And, and the next thing I said, yeah, let's go. Let's go get, I want to get baptized. It just opened my heart. Amen. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Lifestyle evangelism is just being Christ. You know, we are the body of Christ. It's carrying Christ. Carrying that forgiveness. Just like uh, God was in Christ, not reconciling their sins unto them. That's the way we need to be. We need to go and help them to find Jesus Christ as their Savior. All right. Well, I think I covered that pretty well. First, uh, number three, be prepared to share the gospel. Prepare yourself. Pastor Norm shared the scripture last night. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That's a big part of what we're trying to do in these classes, to help prepare you uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. First Peter 3, 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready. Everybody say, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. That's the Boy Scout motto, right? Be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, sometimes we're really concerned about uh, talking to people. Uh, in, you know, opening, we're going to talk a little bit about that too, how to um, introduce a spiritual subject. But what if somebody came to you and said, I need Jesus in my life. How do, I, how do I get Jesus in my life? How can my life change? 
or they came and they said, you know, I see something different about you. You know, you're out on the job, everybody else is swearing and cussing and kicking and fighting and you just have peace. So what's, what's the deal? Would you, be, would you be ready to give them an answer? Would you be able to tell them about what Jesus has done in your life and back it up, you know, with the Word of God? Would you be able to explain that? That's kind of what he's saying there. Set, set the Lord apart in your heart and be ready to give an answer of the reason of, for the hope that is in you. Why do you believe you're going to heaven? Well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ died for my sins. Amen. He was buried and he rose again. Indeed. Hallelujah. And he is living in my heart and I know that he's my Savior and that I've been forgiven of my sins and I am a child of God. Hallelujah. In a survey, most pastors thought this is this was a survey among uh, what we call evangelical pastors. So it's not, not uh, mainline churches that don't really preach the gospel. This is churches that actually believe that people are saved by the gospel. Okay? So they did a survey uh, among those pastors and most of them thought that their people would know how to share Christ. Then they surveyed the people in the churches and most of the people said they wouldn't know how to share Christ with someone. This is really important. You know, we have pastors here. This is something that we need to teach our people, amen, how to share the gospel with someone. It's one of the most basic things, amen, and I believe it's one of the most neglected things in the church. There's, God, there's power in the gospel, Romans 1.16. What are some of the ways that we can share Jesus with people? I don't know what your notes say. What does the notes say? Share your testimony. We've been emphasizing. Pass out tracts. I do that. Some people say, well, tracts, you know, don't work. Well, maybe, you know, maybe they don't work for you. They work for some people. I've, I've led people to the Lord by reading them a little tract, that uh, Steps to Peace with God tract. Just show them the pictures and explain the plan of salvation and, and uh, lead them in a prayer there. Or sometimes they're not ready, but you give them the, you give them the tract to take home and read it and think about it some more. Tracts can be effective. All right, what else? Invite them to church. Some people say, well, that's not evangelism. Well, in some cases, it's not going to work, but um, there's a lot of people that would come if God's people would invite them. That's the truth. If somebody would just say, hey, why don't you come over to church? You know, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a special speaker on Sunday morning, tomorrow morning, and he's going to be talking about uh, healing, God's healing power for your life, and just love to have you come. Just enjoy. Can I pick you up? Or, you know, whatever. But invite somebody to church is, if the church is evangelizing, then inviting the church is a form of evangelism. Amen? Okay. All right, what else? Sharing the scriptures. The Romans wrote. All right? We talked a little bit about that last night. What are some of the scriptures from the Romans wrote? Some scriptures from Romans that we could use in sharing salvation. 323, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, what else? Uh, Romans 5, 8. God commended his love towards us that while we, were, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Just make a note of these scripture references because in your personal study time, take these and, and meditate them and get them inside of you. Joe said, Joel said, I'm working on myself here, that when in my, he listens to my radio program apparently, but he says, well, this is what you preach every week. <laughs> I might preach, you know, from Isaiah or Revelation, or I don't preach too much from Revelation, but all over the Bible, but it always goes back to the heart of God and salvation, you know. And when you have, for example, you have the Romans road inside of you, well, you can always share Christ. Yeah. You have Romans 3.23. Uh, you have uh, Romans 5.8. You have Romans 5.12. By one man's sin. That's very important now, by the way, and, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but to understand why we need salvation in this day and hour. There, there have been times and places where that was not as important because people already accepted that God is the creator and, and that man is sinful. But now there's a discounting of that. So Romans 5.12, 1 
by one man's sin, uh, by one man, sin entered into the, ro the world and death by sin. And then Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is, yeah. but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Romans 10, 9 and 10, that's where you can seal the deal and explain to them how to receive salvation. Smith Wigglesworth, they asked him, what's the best track? He said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> the Bible's a good track, you know. I mean, just carry a, carry a New Testament with you and you can share the gospel. Just say, hey, you know, you got a second? Let me share some scriptures with you. There's a lot of ways to share the gospel. And you've got to find out what works for you. But the important thing is to have the message in your heart and be ready to give an answer and be ready to share your own testimony. All right, the next section is called the simplicity of the gospel. And here again, there's four points here. And these are, you know, when I preach evangelistically, like if I'm overseas, this is my outline right here. You say, well, that, don't you have to prepare? Yeah, I prepare, I meditate. And, but basically, it kind of comes back to these things. If you're trying to explain to someone how to receive Christ, it basically comes back to these things. Now, if you study, for example, I just want to kind of get this across, but if you, if you look, for example, at uh, uh, Peter's sermon, okay, in Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, he didn't talk about creation and and uh, the fall of man. Because the people that he was talking to already knew that. You understand? But if you're talking to Hindus, or you're talking about 20 to 21st century Americans, they don't, they've got that dissected out of their mind. They've been, their mind has been warped. So you have to lay that foundation in order to be able to present the gospel. Otherwise, the gospel doesn't make sense to them. You see what I'm saying? So we got four points. Number one, God made man perfect and sinless. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made man in his own image. God didn't make people sinful. And the problems that are in the world aren't because God made the world that way, which is another big deception. You say, well, if God's so great, then why do we have whatever, you know, wars and fighting? Or uh, God's, That's not God's plan. He put man in a perfect garden, gave him everything, blessed him, amen, gave him dominion. That's God's plan. But, number two, man disobeyed and invited sin and brought death into the human race. And again, look up the scriptures and get them in your heart. All right, then number three, this is the gospel message, but it, you know, the others are important too. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin and rose from the dead. Once you've shared one and two, they're ready for three. Amen? But that's not enough. You know, sometimes I, I'm in churches, I'll hear the pastor, they'll share the gospel message. But you also have to give people an opportunity to say, yes, I want that personally in my life. You know, that's why I believe in giving an invitation for salvation. So number four is, when we repent and receive him as the risen Lord and Savior, he will come into our lives by the Holy Spirit, transform us into children of God, and give us pur purpose. And, you know, I should say there, and I'll add this to the notes later, I, this is a, a work in progress, but we should say forgive them. Forgive them, transform them, and give them a purpose. That's what God does in salvation. He forgives us, transforms us, and gives us a purpose. So that, in a nutshell, is the simplicity of the gospel. Forgives, transforms, and what? And, and uh, gives them a purpose. So I think in your notes it says transforms us. Just add, the, add that phrase, forgives them. Yeah, purpose for living. We have a purpose. We are in God's divine purpose. Praise God. Sharing your personal story. We'll talk some about that. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be a witness. Acts 1.8. What is a witness? One who can give a first-hand account of something seen, heard, or experienced. 
Praise God. I've shared some of my experiences even in this little message here. That's what we can do, you know. That's, that's a huge part of your life. You know, you can talk about the crops, you can talk about music, you can talk about a lot of things, you know. But, amen, your spiritual life's part of the whole picture, right? It's just normal to talk about your whole life. You can share, hey, you know. I mean, how do people get in interested in darts? Somebody must have said, hey, you know, darts are fun. Come ahead. Okay, well, you know, there's 200 and some people playing darts this morning. It's an excuse to drink beer. Well, anyway, I don't want to get... <laughs> but we've got something good to share. Amen? Got something good to share. Praise the Lord. Uh, one who furnishes evidence, one who serves as an evidence, a sign. Your personal story is the greatest testimony to the power of the gospel. Tell them what God has done for you. Tell them how God gave you peace, healed your marriage, delivered you from drugs, revealed his love etc. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, I want to talk just briefly now about how to initiate a conversation about the Lord. All right, first of all, pray. Prayer is the beginning. To get yourself in the mode for evangelism, pray. Jesus told his disciples, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers to the harvest field. And if you look at the next verses, he sent them. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that's how it works. You have to, you know, you have to have, it has to be birthed spiritually through prayer. Okay, pray. When you get up in the morning, Susan and I often pray this, I'm open for business today, Lord. Be sensitive to the opportunities. Look for open doors. It means that God's preparing them to receive from you. You know, kind of watch what's going on. The Holy Spirit's working. You know, on people around you. And, and when they're ready, if you're sensitive, you can jump right in there. I was at an airport in Chicago. And I was sitting there reading my Bible. And uh, this Chinese lady that lived in Ontario, Canada was there. And she was waiting for her plane. And I was waiting for a plane. Different plane, but we were in the same area. And she started talking to me. And somehow she asked me, well, what do you do? What's your, what do you do for a living? Well, she had very poor English. She, you know, it was really hard to understand her. She didn't understand me very well. I told her I was a minister of the gospel and I told her what I was reading and I started telling her about Jesus. And I had my little book, my testimony book, and I gave her that so she could sort through that later and had the sinner's prayer. But <clears throat> then she was just, she just kind of kept asking questions. So she had this little device, this electronic device, where she could, she could type in a Chinese and come out, I mean, she could type in English and it would come out Chinese. So she could find out what I'm saying. So I was able to talk to her about redemption and forgiveness and all these things about salvation, the blood of Jesus and what he did for us, explain the cross. I think I drew a little picture for her of the cross. And, and explain to her the whole plan of salvation. I said, and you can receive him now. Would you like to receive him now? And she prayed to accept Jesus Christ as her Savior right there in the Chicago O'Hara airport. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. And you know what she said afterwards? She just, she, tears were just running down her eyes. And she said, Jesus is my knight in shining armor. Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh well, that, I mean that was that was pretty good. I was I was going on a mission trip. <laughs> in some cases, people see something different about your life, and they ask you about. It. In other cases, with the help of the Lord, you can guide the conversation. And you know, we can witness to strangers, and uh, God will give us grace to be able to do that, and how to. You know, begin to talk. A lot of times I'll talk to somebody and, you know, just within a few minutes I'm sharing a testimony, you know. But I don't try to um, make them feel pushed into a corner. I don't really think that's effective evangelism. You might get somebody to say something, but I don't think you're really changing hearts that way. I, I, I try to get them to open their heart to what I have to say, you know, by being gentle, by giving them something, by giving them love, by giving them encouragement. 
then pray, Lord, open the door, open their heart, open my mouth. <laughs> we need help opening our mouth sometimes. You might ask them about their religious background. Sometimes I've used that. But don't get into a religious argument. Don't try to fight their religion. If they've got so much tradition, what they need is Jesus. Then Jesus can reveal himself to them. Listen to them. That's a biggie. Yeah. <laughs> Some people, you know, really need to be trained in that. <laughs> Listening to others. It really opens people's hearts and they'll relax. All right? <clears throat> Use something to transition into a spiritual uh, conversation, like Jesus with the woman at the well. Remember, he says, I, I have got, if you knew who I was, you'd ask of me and I would give you living water. They're talking, they're sitting at the well and he asked her for water, physical water. He transitions into a spiritual conversation using something in the natural. And a lot of times if you do that, you'll discover if they're ready. If they go, yeah, man, you know, I could sure use some of that. She had an interest, didn't she? Say, well, tell me more, you know. She says, give me this water, you know, I, I need some of that. See, so there was a hunger in her heart. But some peop sometimes people say, yeah, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can tell, well, they're not ready. So you could just plant a seed and, and move on. All right, so there's a lot of different ways. My wife uh, worked in a nursing home for years, and she was able to pray with a lot of people for salvation before they died, you know. Sometimes she would use, has your pastor been to visit, visit you? Well, pastor, church, Jesus. It's a, something to get them on that track of, of thinking, and then she could talk about if they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Identify the felt need in their life. As we mentioned before, they may not, the felt need might not be heaven. It might be something else. And then pray for the need that's in their life. Sometimes God might lead you to use just the direct approach. Have you ever thought about where you would spend eternity? Then you can ask them, you know, if they, if they say, yeah, I'm going to heaven, you can ask them, why do you think so? A lot of people have false assurance based on church membership or baptism or confirmation. And so you can explain to them that they need to personally receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that they can do that today. Do what is natural for you. Or maybe we should say supernatural for you. But what I'm saying there is do what works for you. Amen? Maybe what I do isn't going to work for you. But something will work for you because God's made you a witness. Can I have an amen there? Amen. Okay, leading people in a prayer of salvation. Ask them, would you like to know that your sins are forgiven and that you will go to heaven when you die? Well, yeah, I would. Uh, how, how can I do that? Well, I could lead you in a prayer right now. And then you can lead them into a prayer uh, for salvation. And like I shared last night, um, I usually base that on Romans 10, 9, and 10. So I would lead them in a prayer, something like this. I would say, dear God, I would say, follow me in this prayer. I would say, dear God. They'd say, dear God. I'd say, thank you for Jesus. I believe he died for me. And I believe he rose again. And today, I repent of my sin. And I accept Jesus as the Lord of my life. Jesus is my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me, coming into my life and changing me today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Oh, thank you for that, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Somebody could be pray changed by praying a prayer. Yes. Hallelujah. You're so merciful, Lord. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done but by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for your salvation, Father. And may you use each one of us to lead many people into your grace and to your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
We pray you have been blessed and encouraged by this message from Tom Shanklin Ministries. Tom Shanklin Ministries is reaching the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. We invite you to become part of this worldwide evangelistic outreach through your prayers and financial support. To request our free monthly newsletter, you can reach Tom Shanklin Ministries at 507-407-HELP. That's 507-407-4357. Visit Tom Shanklin Ministries online at TomShanklin.org or send cards and letters to Tom Shanklin Ministries, P.O. Box 4144, Mankato, Minnesota 56002.